that I believe why I was put on this planet is to make cyberspace safe and to raise awareness. So to me, this is about making a difference. Welcome to Life of a CISO. I'm Dr. Eric Cole, your host, and we'll be taking you on a journey each week on what it takes to be a CISO and what are solutions that you can implement today if you are currently a Chief Information Security Officer or if you want to be one in the future. This is Life of a CISO. Welcome, welcome, welcome to one of my favorite times. I look forward to it. I'm so excited when I get to record my Life of a CISO. So welcome, welcome, welcome with yours truly, Dr. Eric Cole. And this is sort of a very, very special day for me. I feel like we should be playing the background song. I'm so excited. I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control and I think I like it. My my book, my official Cyber Crisis, yes, I had the pre-release versions, right, that were soft copy, but now just in the mail, they arrive today, the official, official copies, yes. Uh, so if you haven't purchased it yet, uh, the bookstores will start shipping them out in a couple of weeks, but uh, it has happened, right? It's always nice when you're an author and you work on something for 18 months, when you can actually hold in your hand uh, the finished product with all the endorsements and all the backings. And like I said, th this is a big change for me because I really switched my focus. If you go back and I just give you a little history, 20 years ago, and I believe it was true, the biggest problem in cybersecurity is you didn't have enough technical people properly trained. So that's when I first wrote, I believe back in 20. 2000, I was going to say 2020, 2000, uh, 21 years ago, I wrote my first book, Hackers Beware, and also wrote uh, the best-selling course, uh, Security Essentials, that was really focused on building a market mass and getting people trained on what is cybersecurity, what is the core focus, what is the core principles, and believed that that has been achieved. Now, still need more people. To me, it's one of the fastest growing fields. So if you're looking to make a career change, or you have uh, friends or family members that are either in college or in high school and they're looking for an amazing career, cybersecurity is definitely the way to go. It's very fast growing. But to me, we still need more technical people. However, the problem today, when you see what's happening with organizations, is not that we don't have enough technical people. Because if you go to most organizations, that have had breaches, that have had compromises, and you talk to the technical people, they're not surprised. They're like, Eric, we've been telling them for years. We're telling them that these systems are exposed. You can't have business units making decisions and not listening to cybersecurity. I could tell you all the problems. I knew it was gonna happen, but nobody listened to us. Nobody paid attention to what we were saying. So I've never seen an organization that's had a major, major breach. Like when you're talking these huge breaches of 500 million records, in all these cases, these companies have cybersecurity departments, typically 80 to 100 people. They're spending millions of dollars on cybersecurity, yet they seem to still not get a handle on what's going on. So two or three years ago, I really thought the problem was the individuals don't understand cybersecurity. So I wrote a book, which was a switch. All my other five books were technical focus, right? Hackers Beware, Network Security Bible, Advanced Persistent Threat, Hiding in Plain Sight, right? All those great books. So I switched to a book for the masses, for moms and pops and teachers and individual employees called Online Danger, and really just explained that as individuals, it doesn't matter if you have a dollar in your bank account or millions or billions in your bank account, that you need to recognize that you are a target and cybersecurity is your responsibility. So I, I put that book out and once again, that helped a little, but it still didn't solve the problem. So then two years ago, I said, okay, it's foundational. Because when you look at all these major breaches of servers, Every single one of the cases comes down to a system visible from the internet, not properly patched, critical data that's not properly encrypted. Every single case. So if you just want a quick takeaway, 
If you're a CISO or wanna be a CISO and you wanna be a quick win for your organization, two core rules. You must have asset inventory for systems visible from the internet. And then here's the rules. Any system visible from the internet must be fully patched and must never contain critical data. If you follow those two rules, those simple rules that anybody can follow and understand, major breaches as we see them today attacking servers would not happen. Pick any of them. If we go back even from the major hotel breaches to healthcare breaches, even to the recent solar wind breaches, in all those cases, you had situations where you had systems accessible that weren't patched, critical data that wasn't properly encrypted. And then if you wanna add a bonus third rule that really gets to the heart of the solar winds, all connections must go through a firewall. Any external connection, whether it's a trusted vendor, a third party, anybody, must always be isolated and firewalled and filtered from the rest of your network. It should never sit on your private network with custom with private data. So, so to me, I'm sitting there two years ago going, this seems simple, right? People are trained. We understand the phishing attacks. We know that the danger is from individuals. So we got that with online danger. And we go in and we know that any systems visible from the internet must be fully patched, never contain critical data, and external uh, connections must always be firewalled. This sounds pretty straightforward. Why aren't organizations following it? And that's when I realized the fundamental problem is executives don't understand cybersecurity. We're not speaking in a language that they understand. So this is when I decided that there were two issues. One, there needed to be a resource out there that we could go in and give to executives written in their language. A business book that's easy to read with real examples and factual data that explains cybersecurity to them in business terms that they understand. So that was first challenge. Second, we needed more CISOs that understood business, that thought strategically. And once again, very careful with this. Most, not all CISOs are too technical. Many organizations, not all. So if you're one of the few CISOs, I could rattle off some amazing strategic CISOs that are doing a wonderful job. So I'm not saying all, but many of the organizations that are struggling and having breaches, and many of the CISOs that are struggling out there are because CISO is often viewed in some, not all, right? That's my new phrase, some, not all, most, not all, right? To make sure uh, people don't say, you said everyone. No, I didn't, right? There's always some amazing people out there, but most of the CISOs I run across, it's a technical career track, and that's wrong. A CISO needs to be strategic. So two years ago, I was looking for two resources. I was looking for a business book that executives could read written in their language. And I was looking for CISO certification so people that want to be CISO could be trained on the business and the strategic side so they could effectively do that. And I felt those two would solve that problem. And after searching for many, many, many months, I couldn't find either so if you know and follow my career, I am one of those that if a solution exists, I'm gonna recommend it. And if a solution doesn't exist, I'm gonna create one. So I went over the last two years and I did two things. I wrote Cyber Crisis, which is a business book written for executives. Just want to take a quick break. I hope you're enjoying the show. I have this free webinar that I would love for you to check out if you wanna become a world class CISO. And I actually, reason it took two years was because I spent a lot of time getting it vetted by executives. So if you go, I don't think you can see that, but on the back, I have many executives, uh, leadership positions from CEOs to CIOs, to COOs, to CFOs that read, gave feedback, and essentially wrote endorsements for this book going in and saying, this book solves the problem. 
And I love one of the, the quotes on the front cover. In cyber crisis, Dr. Cole provides cutting edge real world advice on how to protect your businesses and your families from today's persistent cyber threats. And that's from the FBI director, like the former FBI director and a New York Times bestselling author. So to me, I didn't just write the book and claim that it solved it because I know there's always people go, oh, Eric, I, I wrote a book or there's a book out there on cybersecurity for businesses. No, it's not. Because you start reading it and it's all about firewalls, IDSs, false positives. You might put a title on it, right? But executives aren't gonna read it. So I really spent the time to make sure that executives can understand it. So if you know executives, what a great gift. Right, what a great way for your organization. We're actually working with a lot of clients where they're going in and if you either contact us or go to Cyber Crisis Book or secure-anchor.com slash Cyber Crisis or email me, ecole at secure-anchor.com. I'd love to hear from you. We're working with a lot of companies where we're giving them special deals where they're buying between two to 500 and I'm giving them uh, keynotes and executive awareness and sessions. I'm throwing a lot of extra stuff that we normally charge significant amount of money for uh, so we can really solve this problem. To me, it's not about selling the books. It's about solving the problem that's out there. Whenever I write my books, I always go in and donate the money that I make from the book. So I don't make money on the book. So I'm not doing this for the money, trust me, Unless you're Tom Clancy or Stephen King, you don't make millions on books, right? So it's not being done. I will tell you, people that write these types of books, it's a labor of love because if you look at the time, energy, and effort I put into it, I actually make less money. And if I worked minimum wage, I would probably make a lot more, right? Total at the end of the day. But to me, this is my purpose. This is my mission that I believe why I was put on this planet is to make cyberspace safe and to raise awareness. So to me, this is about making a difference. This is about protecting organizations, protecting businesses, and protecting you. So that's why I'm pushing this so hard. Not about the money, nothing but helping you and your business. So if you know businesses or organizations or your business where you wanna get this book into the hands of the executives, the department heads, and the leaders, it's a quick read, couple of hours. What I hear from most people is, Eric, I sat down to read it on the evening or Saturday or Sunday or on an airplane. And the next thing I know, two hours later, I finished it. It's a quick but action-packed, lots of great information. So if you know anyone that could benefit or value from this book, you can either purchase individual copies at your favorite bookseller or please contact me, E. Cole, E-C-O-L-E, -E, at secure-anchor.com and I'd love to give you a great deal. I'd love to throw in a free keynote, an awareness, a fireside chat, a Q&A with your team uh, if you purchase a couple hundred copies of this and we can make a difference and start to secure organizations. One other thing, even if you're not an executive, if you wanna be a CISO or you work in IT or you are currently a CISO, I know your thought is Eric, if this is a high level business book focused on the threats and the issues, I probably know everything that's in that book. And you know something? I agree with you. But here's the trick. You're not reading this book for the cybersecurity knowledge. You're reading this book because this shows you how to talk to your executives. If you read this book and you go in and you talk to executives using the language from this book, you are going to be a world-class CISO because most technical people know technology, they're world-class cybersecurity engineers, and when they go and talk to businesses, what do you think they do? Talk technical. So you're gonna read this book, and I did this once with somebody who was a CISO that was not affected because they were a world-class security engineer and too technical. And they kept reading the book going, Eric, this is too high level. If I go in and talk to my executives, this is not technical enough. This is not what they wanna know. They wanna know the detailed metrics. And I'm like, you're wrong. This is what they wanna know. Most security people overthink it. High level business dollars and cents is what executives want to know. So that's what this book is here. So let's work together to go in and make cyberspace safe to protect your business. Uh, if, if you would like copies of the book, go to secure-anchor.com. 
Cyber Crisis. You can purchase individual copies. Like I said, if you want bulk deals, you can either go to that website or just email me. I'd love to hear from you, love to help you out. And like I said, I'm, I'm doing some crazy stuff uh, for companies, throwing in keynotes and fireside chats that will normally charge uh, 20, 25K for. And just because, like I said, I want to help businesses, you're buying a couple hundred copies of this and we'll go in and help you make it successful because we want your business to be safe and secure. So that was that first problem. The second problem that I found was we don't have enough strategic thinking CISOs and that's why I went in and created my CISO cert. So if you go to secure-anchor.com slash CISO is for that CISO cert or if you go in and do secure-anchor.com slash cyber crisis, you can go ahead and get copies of those books. So I'm super, uh, super excited about it. Looking forward to hearing from you. Looking forward to help protect and secure your organization. And here's what we need to remember. Common sense is not common practice. We need to understand and think the way the people that are getting targeted think. And I'll give you a perfect example of this. I did an experiment two months ago where I took 50 people from different organizations. So I went out and did an offer where I went to healthcare, oil and gas, banking, universities, financial, retail, I mean, across the board, it was a sampling, international sampling, and I was looking for 50 volunteers, and these were from average users. I had some people who worked in finance, some people in HR, engineers, executives, lawyers, MBAs across the board, 50 people. And I gave them a free, 30 minute awareness session where I drill down on here's the current threats. Here's the threat landscapes that are out there today. And I finished up at the very end of the 30 minutes, I finished up with an example. I said, the big threats out there today is anything related to the pandemic. Because if you can get emotional and you can get people to be irrational and fearful, you can get them to do anything. So I said, so if you ever get an email from your HR department, your boss or your executive team that has a subject line that says five coworkers tested positive for COVID and the body of the text said five of your coworkers tested positive for COVID, even though you were working remotely, it's still important to see if you've been in any contact or know anyone who's been in contact with these individuals. It is critical that we go in and protect and keep our organization and employees safe. Please click this link to see who tested positive and whether you need to take any appropriate action. And there's variations of this. It could be with school. Now that schools are opening back up, we see a lot of this where they're targeting schools from the principal of the school saying five of your child's uh, fellow students tested positive for COVID, right? Same exact thing. So I, I gave them that specific example. You ready for this? Two hours later, two hours later, 120 minutes later, I sent those 50 people that exact fish attack that I talked about at the end of the 30 minute session. Anyone want to guess how many people clicked on it? No, I know some of you are saying 50, right? No, no, some of you are saying two or three, 42. 42 of the 50 people that took that training in which I explicitly told them, don't do it, right? Two hours later, 42 of them clicked on it. Now, here's the interesting thing. Of those 42 people, 33 of them, because I talked to them all afterwards, 33 of them said, Eric, after I clicked on it, I had that, oh, crap, moment, right? Where I went, I was like, Rrr, right? Duh, what do I do? So they said 33 of them within five minutes knew that it was a mistake, knew that they shouldn't have done it once they stepped back and thought about it for a moment. But once again, one click is all it takes. And if that was a real attack, they would have been compromised. This is the problem we have today. Now, please don't get me wrong. User awareness is important. If I didn't do that user awareness, it probably would have been all 50, right? So, so at least with some user awareness, right, eight of them didn't click on it, right? So, so there's a little value there. But what we need to remember is how people think 
and act and behave. Because I see a lot of security people and a lot of CISOs, they want to just point the finger. They're going to go in and go, listen, we gave user awareness. We told them about it. We said, don't do this. <clears throat> and they did it anyway. Shame on them. It's their fault. Don't blame me. Well, let me help you out here. If you're a real chief information security officer and you have that attitude, you're not going to be there very long because the organization will get compromised and it will be your responsibility to protect and secure it. So you might go, but Eric, what can you do in that situation? Here's where it's a great CISO. So in that case, we go in and do a couple of things. One is there are newer gateway solutions that can go in and filter out any of those personal related activities. So in my philosophy, you can't go in and block all external email, right? Because that's going to impact the business. And remember, one of our rules of cybersecurity is if anything negatively impacts the business, cybersecurity is wrong, right? Cybersecurity must be a business enabler. If cybersecurity negatively impacts the business, they're wrong. So one thing I do is I go, okay, business is allowed. But anything that's talking about personal activity, whether it's a UPS or a FedEx or a USPS package that's coming, whether it was an order from an e-commerce site, whether it was uh, COVID activity or anything like that, we're just not going to allow that, right? You got to start understanding the problem set that's out there. Now, once again, I, I always say this when I give solutions, there are really some world-class security engineers that they're trained to find fault and vulnerabilities with everything. So there's no perfect solution out there. So when you have those folks, they're always going to find fault because guess what? Perfection doesn't exist. So they're going to, oh, but Eric, but, but Eric, you can't do that because of boom, boom, boom. Well, here's the problem. With that mentality, with the, you have these folks and they're needed because it's good to know, to know the exposures where they find fault in anything. The fundamental problem is they assume what you're currently doing is secure, is 100% secure. So they're going to go, oh, but Eric, if you start not allowing this, this, and this, that could have, have this impact. That Hey, let people have a personal device that's not on the network. Almost everyone today has personal cell phones. So this concept that we have to allow our work computers for personal use is no longer valid. Yes, 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe. But there's absolutely no reason somebody needs to check their personal email on a work computer. They have their phone, right? Let them check it all they want, right? So they have a device for doing that. So we have to understand that there are other solutions out there that's not something that's really important or critical. So if we go in and say, yes, it's not perfect, but if we're now going in and not allowing personal email or personal message or things like that, compared to where we are today, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better. And here's how you have to look at it. If you keep doing what you're doing today, your company has a 90% chance of phish and ransomware that's going to cost your company $4 million. Or you can start blocking, filtering, putting gateway solutions in place and endpoint solutions that filter this out. And maybe there's a little bit of an inconvenience that might cost you 400K. So here's what effective CISOs do. An effective world-class CISO goes in to their executives and says, okay, if we keep doing what we're doing today, we have a 90% chance of having a $4 million hit to our organization. And you validate and verify the numbers. There's lots of data out there. That's option one. Keep doing what you're doing. Option two is we can go in and spend 500K and there might be a small impact to user performance. A, a few people might complain, but it won't negatively impact the business. Which one do you want? I, I don't care, right? It's, it's your choice, but these are the current options that are out there and you get to decide. That's what world-class CISOs do. They present both options with factual data. 
The problem with CISOs that are world-class security engineers, all they do is present the problem and the executives falsely believe that what you're doing today is perfect. So I saw this where uh, a CISO that I'm coaching now and training and getting them to switch from technical to strategy is they would go to their executives all the time and say, I need 400K for this better endpoint solution to stop phishing attacks. I need 300K for this gateway solution to stop ransomware attacks. And they keep getting turned down, turned down, turned down. Because what the executives heard was, even though you're not saying this, you're not not saying it, they're hearing, well, we have no risk today and you wanna spend 700K. So all I did with that person, I switched their presentation. Instead of doing a 15 slide presentation that was all technical focused that nobody cared about, one slide. And it was split in half. And it said today, option one, default. Keep doing what we're doing. 90% chance in this company it was a 1.5 million based on the data. $1.5 million loss. Option two, 700K to reduce that probability to 3%. Which option would you like? One simple slide focused on dollars and cents. And I had their 700K within 24 hours. It's all how you present and accurately give information. From a business standpoint, you need to present both options. What the risk is today if you do nothing and what you want to do, and then let them decide. Remember, when you're talking to executives, one to two slides, non-technical, and it's all about the risk in business terms, the likelihood of occurring, cost of it occurs, and cost to fix it. If you stay focused on that and presenting both options, you will be a world-class CISO. So thank you so much for listening. Please shoot me an email, ecole at secure-anchor.com if you'd like to get some copies, Cyber Crisis. Help me solve my mission, my purpose in life to make cyberspace a safe place to live, work, and raise a family. And it all starts with securing businesses. The number one threat facing businesses today is cybersecurity. Let's work together to fix this problem. Thank you so much. And I'll see you on the next episode.